This is the Ask Foleschini podcast, where the modern economy is discussed from a skeptic's perspective. Mr. Foleschini helps you distinguish what is sustainable in our economy and what isn't. Not everything that glitters is gold, and not all mud is dirty. The podcaster Mr. Foleschini provides no-nonsense advice. He had it all, lost it all, went bankrupt multiple times, and is now attempting to come back from zero with sustainable growth. There are numerous coaches and preachers on the internet that preach about positive thinking and how life is all roses if you just care to see it that way. Well, Mr. Foleschini is definitely not one of them. We recommend you ask Foleschini to keep it real. He discusses the darker side of the current economic reality, the side that's more important for your personal and business finance. His first intention is to help you keep what you already have. Not to be a complete party pooper, Mr. Foleschini will also hint at the earning opportunities in the economy today. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please like, share, and subscribe. And now it's time to start taking notes. The mic goes to the podcaster, the one and only Mr. Foleschini. Welcome to the Ask Foleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Whitney Alexandra from Tempe, United States. Whitney is a performance coach for top women entrepreneurs who want to create wild wealth, freedom, and success beyond what most people dare to dream. Whitney, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Oh man, I've got a I've got a long story. Um, but I think it really started when I was about 18 or 19 years old. I walked into an office building. I had a brown suit on and a string of pearls, and I called myself a professional, right? No, no experience, but it was in that moment that I learned that you could show up and have the job that you wanted. And um, and I really just sort of ran with it from there. I started coaching entrepreneurs, working with them to develop their businesses. And that was more than 20 years ago. So I've worked with, you know, hundreds of executive leaders and hundreds of entrepreneurs now. And yeah, it's been such a, a wonderful privilege to have uh, such a great career working with so many wonderful people. Yeah, I just read that uh, you became member of the prestigious Forbes Business Council this year. Would you yeah. tell us more about this uh, business council? Yeah, so um, it's very it's very exciting, and thank you for thank you for celebrating that. Um, you know, I'm 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 like every other entrepreneur. We forget to celebrate ourselves and these achievements. So thank you for the reminder. Um, so the Forbes Business Council is actually actually really cool. It's a combination. They've got a number of different groups. Um, so whether you're a business coach or you're a professional in another way, you can join this group of thought leaders and you're contributing to articles. You're helping to shape really the future voices of those people that are reading Forbes and and uh, and contributing to Forbes. You are now specializing in uh, female entrepreneurs. Yes. Uh, was that always so, or you started specializing, or it, it was there a cutoff point somewhere in the past and said, okay, I'm the best in this field and I'm going to focus on on uh, just on one gen? Yeah, I, I love that question because there was no clear cutoff. Right. I've had I've had a really successful and great relationships with many, many male executives, lots of CEOs, million dollar, billion dollar CEOs. Um, But it really was for me the shift during the pandemic where I saw a lot of women taking a back their careers, taking a back seat, their businesses, taking a back seat to their partners, supporting the families and all doing really wonderful things. But I started to think to myself, like, there's going to be such an enormous gap here between what these women are able to do over these couple of years. And, you know, and then they've got the consistency of typically a male partner, um, male partnership. And so I really just wanted to be someone that was contributing to their success and helping them grow their business faster because a lot of them really get stuck in a different mindset loop than a typical male executive would. And so I thought, you know, I've got the same female brain. Let me, let me help um, crack the code for them as well. Ah, great story. Yeah. I would like to ask you something. More than 50% of our listeners are female. 
And I, I do believe that it was uh, really important for us to get you that specialize in female entrepreneurs on, on our podcast. So thank you again for that. Um, I would like to ask you, when we, we, we go into the, the differences between men and female entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. is it true that female entrepreneurs have different priorities and treat things differently? Could you explain a bit about these differences and why it's so important to empower female entrepreneurs? Yeah, what a wonderful question. You know, years ago, I worked with this woman and she had a brilliant way of describing this. She said, you know, most women entrepreneurs will go to, you know, get some some type of advanced certification in their profession. They'll get, you know, a degree, a master, something, an extra certificate, and they'll work for someone and they're doing all of these free sessions and they're really building their business till they feel like they're at a point where they can actually charge for their services. And even then they're probably charging a very small amount for what the value of the product or service that they actually provide is. Um, and so the example she gave was, here's what a typical woman entrepreneur would do, right? We do all of these things. And what does a male entrepreneur do? Typically they say, I've got a hammer, I've got a truck, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm in business, right? And so it's a lot more, it's a lot more, um, focused and it's a lot faster that a lot of men typically would start and scale their business. Um, and you know, the confidence levels come at it, come at a different rate as well. Um, and so it's very interesting. So a lot of the work that I do is working with women entrepreneurs. How do we get you in action right now? How do we make sure that there is no big delay, that we're not starting um, your services off in a cheap way or a free way? You know, everyone is out there building their business, but typically they're coming from a place where they've already got a substantial amount of experience. Maybe they're a corporate executive or someone who has, you know, a long and valuable career, a great skill set. Why should their services be? Be free or cheap, you know? And so I think it's taking a lot of that mindset of, you know, getting into action quickly. This is why I also call myself a performance coach, because I think let's get into motion quickly. Um, what can we do to make things happen faster and easier and with more joy in your life? Is there the, the main reason for lower pricing and underpricing services uh, despite all the professional experience, is the main reason in lower self-esteem or lower confidence, as you call it, or is the main reason that uh, female entrepreneurs are not so uh, wealth-building driven uh, and they want to change things and more uh, get more freedom for the, themselves and, and, and their families uh, instead of just uh, building wealth? So is, is that uh, self-confidence a problem or a priority problem or challenge? You know what? That is an excellent question. And I think the short answer is both. It is typically you're seeing someone who, you know, I talk a lot in my business about worth and your self-worth and what you believe your services are worth. And, you know, I think sometimes that gets mistaken when people say charge what you're worth. Well, I'm priceless. You're priceless. Our services typically are priceless for people. They should have a big impact. And so I think that's where like things get a little muddy for people sometimes. Um, but the second, the second option you gave me, which was, you know, not as wealth driven, I find women entrepreneurs, they are fiery. They are ready to change the legacy for their family. Um, I find that sometimes it does get a little messy when you're thinking about really wanting to make an impact um, and then the income on the other side, because, you know, sometimes they think or people will say, you know, if you're a spiritual entrepreneur, that should be a gift that shouldn't be free. Um, And so I think things get a little messy sometimes when when you're trying to when you're trying to say, okay, well, I want to make the biggest impact. How do I impact the most amount of people knowing that the most amount of people can't pay for your services? So I think there's a tendency to like, to believe that if I lower my prices, then I can help, 
you know, more people, which is not true. Um, you know, typically what we'll see is someone who invests, they invest in the level of their transformation. So, you know, if I'm willing to invest, you know, how many entrepreneurs have bought, I don't know, a $10 course, a $20 course, something like that. And the impact that, you know, the course could have had could be helping them make millions or helping them make, you know, a considerable difference in their business, but they're not valuing it in that same way, right? We have, I think there are so many entrepreneurs that have like a big bookshelf or a digital bookshelf full of courses we've never opened before. Um, and so the value is not um, really understood or captured in the same way. So I think it is both. What is, uh, according to you, the main advantage of female entrepreneurs uh, compared to uh, male entrepreneurs. You 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 started uh, hinting that uh, 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 male entrepreneurs just uh, buy their truck and start uh, going on and 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 do it, and they don't care uh, whether they're qualified or not. And that the female entrepreneurs they get qualified first, and then they they go uh, and uh, um, offer their services. Uh, what is the that is one of the differences. What is uh, what, what is uh, your assessment? Is is the main difference uh, between sexes in, in in entrepreneurship? I think you know, like if we just go back for a minute, I feel like you could we could have the same level of education, and it's the difference in when I feel ready to begin, right? And I think that's part of it is having that mindset of like, okay, I've done the certification or I've done the thing, and now I'm ready. And the readiness typically for women happens a little slower and it happens after they've got substantial amount of proof points. It's not the self-belief isn't exactly the same, but I think the, the, the biggest differences that I see between women and, and male entrepreneurs is that um, we use different language. So I've never had an executive CEO tell me he wasn't confident in front of a group of people. Instead of, I've heard him say, you know, I didn't feel prepared. The words didn't sound like me. Um, you know, they'll use different words, but at the heart of things, we're talking about confidence. I didn't feel like I could show up and really um, do my thing. Um, but one of the other big, one of the other differences that I see um, is that we have women who are a lot more focused on impact, a lot more focused on community, leveraging their businesses to do more good, sort of that ripple effect that you might see in, you know, a community of some sort. So if I think about, you know, a typical, you know, woman entrepreneur, they're typically hiring a number of women to support their business. They're supporting usually a number of women entrepreneurs as clients. They're probably, you know, giving a little bit more. I think the research shows, at least here in North America, that um, women entrepreneurs tend to give a lot more to their community, um, both financially and of their time. So I think there are a number of benefits, not to mention like many of my clients and many women entrepreneurs also are mothers. And so having the flexibility in most cases that they're able to still do the um, the things that bring them joy in the family. So whether it's, you know, knowing that they're not at work um, late at night, they're able to pick their child up from hockey or they're able, to, uh, I'm in Canada. So you, yeah, picking them up from hockey or picking or, you know, making a meal, baking with them on the weekends, whereas, you know, um, not, not that that doesn't always happen in a male driven entrepreneurship. What is with, with everything that now uh, you mentioned, all, all these advantages, what is the number one advantage of female entrepreneur compared to male entrepreneur? That's a great question. Um, what is the main difference? You know, I think the main difference, I think one of the I think one of the most interesting things about women entrepreneurs is that, you know, we look to others for signs of success. And when we see another woman, we already know that there are many, there are much fewer women in businesses or scaling to the same size as other, you know, male ventures. And so I think 
every woman that's successful shows another woman that they don't need to have a small business. They can have a business of the size that they choose. They can have, you know, whatever it is that they desire. So I think having more women in seats of power, um, doing awesome things in their business really is, you know, helping show other women it's possible for them too. Um, I have, um, that's more like a provocation now. So okay. I would say that there would be equal amount of male and female entrepreneurs. How would that affect, uh, how would that macroeconomically affect um, our economy? Would that a lower interest rate, would that lower inflation, what would happen if there would be an equal amount of uh, entrepreneurs of uh, both sexes? You know, that's probably a better question for you. I have no idea on the <laughs> on the economics of it. <laughs> um, I have zero idea on the economics of it. Um, my clients, we do something that they call magic math with Whitney. And so it's not true math, but it's more of the, you know, what is that ripple effect in their business when they're able to scale, when they're able to um, get their business to the next level. Okay, so provocation didn't work out. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not the. That's not in my zone of genius. <laughs> uh, when you are uh, improving performance, because you're a performance coach. Yeah. Would you be more on the side of grind, 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 or balance your life? What is uh, your side in 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 this uh, everlasting battle? Yeah. Well, and I think you hit the, you hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of people, when they hear performance coaching, they think this person's going to make me work harder and, and like really be on me about getting results. And the second part is true. I care deeply about my clients getting great results. Um, but I don't personally believe you have to hustle and grind in order to be successful. And so a lot of the coaching that I do with people is really getting to the heart of what it is that they desire. And let's make more room for that. Let's have a very focused plan on that. I think it's impossible for people to have more than one or two objectives or things that they're focusing on, right? The back and forth and the context switching, the energy lost in switching back and forth with your focus, you just lose all productivity. And so, you know, a lot of work that I do with them is getting really clear on what would have the most impact in their business. How do we um, achieve that really quickly? Um, how do we clear the right amount of time so that they're able to, you know, really enjoy things so that it's not a 60 hour work week as an entrepreneur, but that you can say like, I work 20 hours, I work Monday through Thursday, whatever your thing is. Um, and I'm here to sort of give them other ideas, be a thought partner and be an accountability partner through the process. But I really do believe because I've seen it all, right? You can have exactly the business that you want, exactly the life that you want. Um, but it just takes like having some of those boundaries and really being honest with yourself about what is going to fill you up. So short answer, it's about joy and desire. And I know that doesn't sound like typical phrases we talk about in the business world, um, but it is true. Very nice. You mentioned a bit about focus. So if I look at the things in completely logical sense, focus is the complete opposite of multitasking. Yeah. And uh, females, you're famous for multitasking. <laughs> Does that mean that uh, you have to uh, move away from multitasking and focus uh, also on day-to-day uh, -day operation? Or is focus uh, important just on strategic level? Yeah, I think focus can be achieved in a few different ways, right? So if someone, and, and I also don't believe that anyone is good at multitasking. I think that is fake news. We've told ourselves that we're good, um, or we have a couple of proof points to show that we're good. Um, but I believe, you know, focus can happen in a number of different ways. You could say, 
you know, Monday or Tuesday is my day when I just work on this strategic project. That's all. And there might be a few different things that need to happen that feel like multitasking through that day in order to achieve your project. Um, but even just a few little tricks like that will help you feel more focused. Like you're like, you can put your full energy into something. Um, it could also be like an hour of focus time, you know, turning off notifications and some of those things that we know are a distraction. They just chew away and eat away at our calendars um, and the time we have set aside for things that are important. So I think there's there's probably a way to do both, but I think multitasking is like overrated, not possible. <laughs> and we should try, we should try and limit the amount of times when we require multitasking. Because when I hear someone tell me that they need to multitask in order to get it all done, that tells me we've got a problem with focus and like focusing on the right things, focusing on like, what's really going to move your business forward? What's really, you know, a project or something that is lighting you up that you want to work on? Because we know if it's a project that you were really excited about, you're going to carve out time, right? If you say, I, I'm so excited to go on this vacation, or I'm so excited to start writing my book, or I'm so excited to go to this awesome networking event, you're going to find the time to do it. Um, and so this is really just an exercise in being honest and uh, on like, how much can you do? And where do you need support? In my practice, I found out uh, that as a risk manager, I get to talk mostly with female mm. because they're much more risk aware, not averse, but aware. And because they're risk aware, they are much better in finding options how to assume risk, how to avoid risks, and how to transfer risks. So um, they do not assume high risks. Their profits are a bit smaller for that, but they're really constant. Would you agree that female entrepreneurs are much more constant than male entrepreneurs just because they do not assume really high risks? I think um, I think a lot of what you said is true. The consistency, I see a lot of entrepreneurs that are women who have a very consistent business and consistency is great, right? Like we love consistency, um, but you don't have those peaks and valleys. You don't have those, you don't have those additional like big wins or windfalls of other things that come in, which I think happen when you're willing to, be a little bit more risky with some of your uh, uh, some of your choices, some of your options. So if I think about it, you could have a woman entrepreneur that's, let's say, uh, making somewhere between between ten and twenty thousand dollars a month, right? Like a very healthy business, making a good amount of profit, and maybe her calendar is maxed out. For her to get to the next level, she probably has to invest in a team member. Right. And there's risk with that. There's risk. It's a big, it's a bigger financial investment. It's things like that. And so um, I think there are many ways that we see them uh maybe taking a step slower than a male counterpart because they are going through, like you mentioned, all of those other that risk analysis and understanding, wanting to be really sure about it. Um, yeah. So how could we? How could we mix best female and best male uh, attributes in a winning combination? What is your take on that? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I'm always I'm always putting a bit of a gender lens on decisions, on challenges, on situations, right? Like. First, I start with, this is how I think, this is how I would approach it. This is what I want to do. And what would, you know, you can even use a fictional character. Like I love billions. I love the show billions, if you're familiar. So, you know, even looking at some of those char characters and saying like, how would they handle this situation, right? Almost like an a bit of an alter ego um, where you're able to still leverage some of those strengths and some of those um 
and some of those qualities that we admire in male entrepreneurs too. I think there's a lot of great qualities that men bring to the table, women bring to the table. So like you said, sort of learning how to leverage those, even with with most women entrepreneurs, the softer skills are things that, you know, typically most male entrepreneurs don't have the same level, but they can also be a bit of a hindrance to the to the business too. So it's how do you find the balance? Think how do you find the balance in everything, in every relationship? But it's definitely healthy to challenge, you know, is this something that I feel because I'm a woman, because I'm a woman in business, or is this something that, you know, my male counterparts would do the same thing? Um, so I think that's a super easy exercise anyone could take away. Okay. I was implying at male female teams. How you would put a male female team together? Is there any um, is there any tip how uh, the let's say entrepreneurial couple, regardless if they're uh, if they're not a couple uh, couple in in their uh, private life, how would yeah. you assemble a winning team? What skills and uh, what advantages of one sex and uh, 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 from other sex uh, you you would um, uh, you, you would expose or uh, what you think are the most important from uh, advantages from one sex and from another sex. Oh, interesting. Gee, you're really putting me on the spot with some of these questions. <laughs> you're um, the best. Uh, you're the only one I can ask because there's yeah. no better one than you for yeah. entrepreneurship. So <laughs> Okay. Um, well, you know, I, I am such a big believer that people need to work in their zone of genius. So it could be that you are a woman that has an incredible zone of genius in finance or in operations, which are not typically the places that we would see women leaning into their zone of genius. You could also be a man that has an incredible sense of marketing, communication, and some of these other softer skills that traditionally we see women, um, you know, advance and accelerate their careers in. So I don't know that it always comes down to women are better at this and men are better at that. I think it's really about finding a partnership regardless of gender, where you have balance, where there is some clear um, where you can be in your zone of genius and you've got enough balance with that other person that they are also in their zone of genius. You know, there's um, there's a couple of women that I work with and they are brilliant partners and one loves to be in front of, in front of the camera and in front of the clients and doing all of the marketing and the other one loves to be behind the scenes. And, you know, so I think you're going to find these differences, whether it's different genders, same genders, um, but all partnerships, I, I think people just need to be really honest about where they shine and do more of that. Great answer. Is there anything else you would like our listeners to take from this interview? Can you share any trade secrets or oh. quick tips for our listeners? Yeah. You know, I was listening to one of your earlier, um, to one of your earlier podcasts and you were talking about, um, you know, not just this positive thinking and, and, and having belief, but so often we go back to past stories, past experiences, and we make them mean something that they don't need to mean anymore. And so I think a lot of women entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs, if you're willing to do the work, it's going back to, you know, where did this thought or belief come from and how do I remove it? You know, and that's a lot of the work that I do. It's not just positive thinking into the results that you want. It's really about getting to the root and the cause and the reason for why we show up the way that we do. And then, and then learning to kind of rewrite how we work with that. Right. So instead of your subconscious sort of um, calling all the shots, keeping you small, keeping your business a certain size, because maybe you, you know, had a mistake with money, or maybe you don't think you're good at business or can't be a leader. Um, you know, it's really working with those two. So I always encourage everyone to like interrogate the thoughts 
that you have in your mind. It's not just about glazing over and thinking positive. It's about really getting to the heart of like, why do I feel this way? Okay. And before we close, where can our audience reach you? The the best way to find me is on my website. It's WhitneyAlexandra.co. And I'm always hanging out on Instagram. So you can find me there as well, Whitney Alexandra. Okay. I will put the links to both uh, in the description below. Thank you, Whitney, for being my guest tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Faleschini, for this outstanding podcast. And thank you for listening to the Ask Faleschini podcast until the end. Mr. Faleschini would love to hear your feedback in the comments. And don't forget, if you want to know, ask Faleschini or listen to the Ask Faleschini podcast. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.